aware, first of all, of a few of the materials. Uh, the things out on the desk outside are all free. In the hallway, there's one here on reflexology, and then another one on yoga. There's a number of them, so please avail of those. Those are free, and you can take whatever you would like, and you can be aware of some of the dangers and problems that arise through uh, those uh, uh, various forms of alternative medicine and so on. Then uh, Paul has materials here at the back. Now Paul's not with us, uh, but Hannah's here. And so there's one on soul winning, uh, how to win souls for Christ. And that's a very important uh, ministry and should be for every true believer. And if you have never uh, purchased those, we would encourage you to get them and listen to them uh, because they're very comprehensive and they really take from so many authors and teachers of the subject books on soul winning and they're really all condensed and brought together into this series and uh, I found this very helpful uh, in the work of the ministry uh, over the years so if you'd like that you can see Paul or Hannah with those and then one on the menace or the problem of Freemasonry uh, you can get a look at that and then one for uh, each uh, Friday night meeting they're recorded as well and they're just available at the bottom so you can take a look at those. Now we're going to turn together in our Bibles to the book, Little Book of Joel. Uh, the Little Book of Joel. And if you're not sure where it is, well, if you go to the end of the Old Testament and start moving backwards, uh, you'll get back probably one of the bigger books is uh, Amos. And just before Amos, we have a little book with three chapters and it's called The Little Book of Joel. So we're going to read uh, from this uh, little book tonight, and we're going to commence at chapter 1, Joel chapter 1 and verse 1. Joel chapter 1 and verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? <coughs> tell ye your children of it, and tell your children to tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath taken, and hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and the, that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without teeth, whose, without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The, police, the priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languished, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, also the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withhold, withheld from the house of, the God, of our God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, into the house of the Lord our God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It is, is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods, the, gar the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan, the herds and the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture, yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Turn over with me now, please, to the little book of Nehemiah. 
And if you go back again, if you're not familiar with it, uh, go back before the book of uh, Job and uh, back to Esther before it, and then you'll get the little book of Nehemiah. And I want to read a few verses from Nehemiah uh, chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. And we're going to read a few verses that will become more apparent and relevant when we look at the message. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of, the, of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers or their ancestors. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Amen. And God will bless the reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your precious word. We thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, we ask that uh, tonight that you would uh, hear prayer that has been already offered, and that you would put a hedge around us, Lord, and that in this uh, little room that, Lord, you would pour your Holy Spirit. We come to you, Lord, and I afresh lay my life before your altar. I give myself body, soul, and spirit to you. I pray that you would cleanse me and sanctify me and set me apart that you would graciously pour forth your Holy Spirit and that your Holy Spirit would come and speak into all our hearts. We ask that we would become really conscious of your presence, Lord. Bless your truth. I take authority in your name over every spirit and power that does not confess that Jesus is Lord. And I pray that the truth will permeate into our hearts and transform us. Hear our cry. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to speak to you tonight on the divine warning and repentance. The divine warning and repentance. I found it fascinating when reading the little book of Joel just to discover some facts that I didn't know before. The simple background to the little book with just three chapters is that, first of all, we don't know much about Joel. We just know his father. But other than that, we don't know anything. But he was, it was written approximately 845 BC. So eight centuries before Christ was born, this was uh, written. And it's reckoned by most commentators. They're not unanimous on it, but they reckon that this was the first written prophecy of the little prophets. He was the first to write. So he wasn't the first prophet, but he was the first written prophet as a prophet. Uh, and it was in around about 845. Now the day into which he came and spoke was a very unique time in Judah's history. Uh, we know that there was a queen who had taken up and usurped the throne. This queen was called Athaliah. And this queen was very wicked. She had been married to the king, and when the king died and when her son died, she decided in order to usurp and take control of the throne that she would kill all the male children that would take ultimately the throne in the future. And really she was like the Herod of the New Testament. She sought to wipe out the royal line. And of course, that was something that happened consistently from the time that it was said that Jesus would come on that royal line, that there were attempts and Satan utilized different people to try and wipe out the line. And this almost happened only for the fact that a little child, the youngest child uh, called uh, jo Joash, was saved by this woman's sister. She took him, passed him on to a, a maid or a, a helper, and they took the little child of one years of age and they hid him in the house of the Lord. And he kept hid for six years. 
until the time came when he was presented as king and this woman who had taken the throne and sought to wipe out the royal line, she was put to death. So it was unheard of that a woman would be on the throne, totally contrary to the promises of God that there would be a man on the throne that would lead ultimately to the Messiah. But nevertheless, that's a little of the background of the, what was going on uh, in, in the little nation. And also, there was all the common and typical sins that we read of in the prophets, primarily idolatry. The interesting thing about Joel is that Joel comes thundering with a message from the Lord, but he doesn't point out any specific sin. He's quite a unique prophet. And it's assumed that he, as he preached and warned of what he did warn of, the people instinctively and through, through conversation and just the life of the nation, they knew what the sins were. And they knew that they were under judgment. And so this, this man comes. And really what triggers this prophecy is that a very unusual event has occurred in Judah and in the nation. And what has happened is there has been a, a complete a, a, a influx of locusts, a swarm. And this swarm of locusts have come and they have completely decimated the nation. They have eaten everything. And to the extent that there's no food, they can't bring any offerings to the house of God. Uh, it's just uh, devastating. And if we were to try and really get the, the um, thrust and the spirit of the book, what we're talking about is in, in Old Testament language is 9-11 has just happened. If you're to try and comprehend it, that, that's the mind of the prophet. He's, he's making the nation aware we've had a 9-11. Something has happened that has never, ever happened before. We're absolutely reeling as a nation. We never ever heard of this and we certainly never anticipated it. The person who God uses is Joel. And I want to speak for a little time first of all on the prophet. You see, the Old Testament prophets, those who certainly wrote the scripture, the Bible tells us in Peter, that the scriptures came as holy men of God spake as the Spirit and led, guided, and directed them. He was a holy man of God. We know that. Now, some prophets in the Old Testament were not holy. But he was a holy man of God. Not only that, he had this unique gifting from the Lord. It was the gift of the prophet. It's a gift. And for that gift to operate, you, there's two requirements. The first requirement is the ability to hear from God. And that's a gift. The ability to hear from God. And secondly, the courage to tell out what God has told you. <coughs> because prophecy, certainly in Old Testament times, was not always good news. God sent the prophets when the nation was in trouble. And so he came and he heard from God and he had the courage to tell out what God wanted to be done. Now in this little book in chapter 2 and verse uh, 28 we read these words and he tells, he's speaking now again we're 800 years or more before the birth of Christ, before Pentecost, eight to nine hundred years. And this is what he says. In the future it will come to pass, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Here's the Lord almost a thousand years beforehand moving this prophet to foretell not only of the bad things that we're going to look at, but something that's good that's going to happen in the future. 
This thing that's good is to do with the pouring out of the spirit of prophecy. And prophecy manifests here in two unique ways that is spoken of for the future. And the first one is that there would be dreams. Dreams come when you're sleeping. So it's said that the old men will dream dreams. But then it says the Lord will also give the gift of prophecy to the young people and the young people will see visions. So this is the ability to either see a cine camera running or to see just pictures. But the Lord said a thousand years before Pentecost, this is what's coming. I'm going to do this and he said I'm going to do it with the old and I'm going to do it with the young and I'm going to do it with women just in case women feel left out and sometimes in some churches the women are relegated to the back just to put on a hat and be quiet and say amen if they're allowed to uh, some really but here the Bible's very explicit in the last days he said I will pour out my spirit upon the handmaids and in those days I'll uh, pour my spirit upon them and then he says in verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, and so on. So all very, very, very powerful and, and, and really absolutely devastating whatever's been talked about, this sun and moon and stars and heavens. We know that in the book of Acts, and we're not going to look it up for the sake of time, but in Acts chapter 2, you'll, most of you be familiar that this is fulfilled. This actually happens, what was told by Joel, because when the Holy Ghost comes in the day of Pentecost in the upper room, and they come out and they begin to preach and begin to speak with other tongues as the Lord gives them utterance, then of course the people said they're drunk. And Peter stands in the midst and he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that. A thousand years. And he knew by the Spirit of God that that moment when Pentecost happened, Peter knew by the Holy Ghost that Joel has just been fulfilled. And the thing is about the day of Pentecost is that we were ushered into a new age. We're ushered into an age where not only as saints, uh, many Christians are aware that that we are a priest to God. Every one of us who are born again, uh, you're a priest to God. So we're not like the Roman Catholic Church where you have just the priests who look after everything, a handful of men who are not married, who look after all the responsibility. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that you're a holy nation, you're a priest. Every one of you are priests unto God. And that means we can all come into the presence of God. We don't need a mediator of a man, but we have the man, Christ Jesus, to be our mediator. And so this is fulfilled, and Peter declares it. And so we not only recognize uh, today that we are priests to God, but what we should comprehend and often don't as believers is that not only is the priesthood, we're all priests to God, but we're also all potentially prophets to God as well, every one of us. The gift of the prophet is poured forth to all. Now, I know there are some who have a unique calling in that ministry, but the gift of prophecy is available to all according to the scripture. It was poured out on the old, the young, the handmaids. It wasn't something to be hidden in a corner for just a man and a woman now and again to appear. And so it, this is fulfilled when God sends forth the prophet. But then I want to look at, briefly at the warnings through unprecedented events. There's been a catastrophic event that has happened in the nation. To anybody looking on, it is a natural disaster. Locusts have come and destroyed. It's catastrophic, it's a terrible event, but it just happened. That undoubtedly is the mind of a lot of people. But it is into that very environment and into that mindset as the people are still living in the shock of the event that Joel comes forth. 
And the Lord carries the truth uh, forward through this voice. It's as though the event is not is not clear enough by way of what God is attempting to say through this event which he has sent. Not every event uh, can we say that it is definitely a judgment from God. But I think today in our modern Christian society is that as believers we don't look at big events. We're not encouraged to look at big events. We look locally, we look to the church, we look to what's happening in our lives, but we tend not to look at big events. I have to say the first person in my life as a Christian that triggered me to think about big events was, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Transformation, Alistair Petrie. He was the first man that made me think about big events. And when you read the prophets, you discover it's all about big events. It's all about God communicating to the earth, to his people, through events, crises events, that are happening in the nation. Most Christians today will not even consider that the events which are happening nationally for us at the moment are of really great significance spiritually. But they are. We are in uncharted waters in our nation at the moment. There's a real possibility that the kingdom that has been there for 300 years will very possibly break to pieces. That's a huge event. That's huge. But very often we don't see these things. And so God sends the prophet to make the event clear to the saints, to comprehend what God is doing and the big picture. Very often God has done this. Noah was sent by the Lord to warn of the judgment. He preached 100 years. Nobody listened. Whenever Sodom was living in, in a, a complete perversion and homosexuality was rife in every region of the area, in the, into the midst of that situation, God sends his angels to rescue Lot. And again, there is, there, there's judgment comes. And the Bible says in the book of Jude that, that Sodom is set forth as an example, as a warning to every generation that will live thereafter that God will punish sin. Then of course we have Egypt which the, uh, these people would have known all about and that's what makes this very relevant. They knew about the judgments, the ten great plagues that came on the nation of Egypt. They knew about that. And what was distinct and shocking to them as Joel began to preach was this. They knew that locusts were a judgment on, on, on a non-godly nation. They knew that this was one of God's methods of punishing a people for their sin, where the shock was that God would do it on his own people. That was the shock. They never anticipated that God would turn his judgment on his people. You know, that kind of thinking is not present in the church today. God will punish his people today. God will punish a people who do not walk according to his ways. Warnings are necessary, but they are unpopular. Warnings are necessary from God, but they are unpopular. You're not going to become flavor of the month if you get up and tell people that God is not pleased, that things are going wrong because of sin, and that the only way back is to turn back to God. That's not popular. As we've stated, Noah warned the people for 100 years. It was God's warning to the pre-flood people. But they didn't want to hear. The flood did come, as you know.
Lot, we're told, he became very spiritual when the angels revealed to him that they had been sent from God to take him out and that Sodom was going to be burned to a cinder and all its inhabitants, for the wrath of God was now going to be poured out on these perverse cities with all their evil as it rose up before God and into his nostrils. God said, it has come to the end. My, my anger has been simmering like, like in a saucepan of milk. He said, I have been simmering with my wrath, but now my wrath is coming over. And that's the way God works. His wrath simmers for a long time, but then eventually it boils over. And when it does, it can't be averted. When it's simmering, it can be averted. It can be switched off. The damage can be prevented. But once it boils over, the damage is done. And when God begins to boil over on a nation, boil over on an individual, boil over on a community, it can't be stopped. Lot became really spiritual. And he ran to his sons-in-law who were married to his daughters. And he said to them, up, get out of this place because judgment's coming. God is going to destroy this place. And they laughed him to scorn. Because Lot had been a money guy all his life. Lot kept God on the back burner. He was a typical church man, Sunday morning suit, Sunday evening, even midweek prayer meeting, saying all the right things, maybe elder or deacon, knew a bit of the Bible, but loved the pound. Oh, you could fit Lot into any average evangelical church today. You could put him on the board, put him in with the elders, put him next to the minister, no problem. You could fit him in there. But they laughed him to scorn. And the judgment came. Jeremiah warned them of impending judgment as he pleaded with the people and wept over them that God would have mercy, that they would turn from their ways, that they would turn to God and obey him. And they took poor Jeremiah and they threw him into an old cesspit, into an old uh, stale, rotten a uh, uh, pit full of filth and dirt and he went down into the very neck in it. Warnings are necessary but they're unpopular. God always punishes, or sorry, sin always punishes its people. Now this is very important. Sin always punishes its people. Now, I have heard and I have done it myself where people in the past where you say, oh, well, that man committed an awful crime and he got away with it. And we'll just have to wait till the last day and God will get him at the judgment. Well, that's true. God will get them at the judgment. But I'm afraid that's not good theology, even though I have preached it myself. Because the Bible is very explicit that when you sin, you begin to bear the consequences of that sin straight away. In other words, you don't commit loads of crimes. You don't murder or steal or lie or whatever. And, you know, you just kind of run away with it and there's no impact on you or on your family. Or there's nothing happening. And then suddenly you die and God gets you for it then. It doesn't work like that. And the Bible's very clear about that. You see, friends, in Galatians, you know these words, Galatians 6 and 7, and there's many Old Testament scriptures that, that allude to this, and they say, being not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So there's, there's sowing and there's reaping. Now, one thing I want to really, this is where I want to emphasize this latter part, that I feel very strongly that God wishes us to consider, and especially those who are engaging in prayer and seeking the Lord for the land. You see, the thing about it is, 
we're not always tuned in, just like the issue of the big picture. Our culture as Christians today in, in Ulster and across the world, in Ireland, wherever it might be, certainly in Western Europe, our, our culture doesn't encourage us to go into certain areas that are very important. We are, we are aware of the fundamentals of the faith, justification by faith and salvation through the Lord Jesus. Wonderful truths, wonderful truths in our culture that we want to imbibe to the next generation and we want to seek to preach them and proclaim them and help others. We thank God for all those who do that. But I, I want to draw your attention to something in relation to this sin punishing its people. Let me give you an illustration which may help. On a number of occasions, I, I have had the privilege of praying with people. And I, I remember on one occasion praying with a lady. And she was a lovely Christian. And she, she felt... Uh, now, this may sound repetitive of a previous story, but nevertheless, some are a little repetitive. But nevertheless, this woman was a lovely Christian, really seeking the Lord, but she knew there was something wrong in her Christian life. She knew there was an area where she could not grow in advance in her Christian life. And so she came to see me, and we talked it over, and I said, well, I really don't know, but obviously you feel it, so we'll pray. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened because that's not necessary, other than to say that when we prayed, the Lord very powerfully began to minister into that woman's life. And she began to behave in a very, let's say, in a way that wasn't normal. She began to give signals like this, which you would see in a, in a rock concert. Whenever people, you know, that's, that's a sign of the submission of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to the goat. Uh, it's a very much a demonic sign, and, and she tried her best to try and curse me. Now, she didn't know she was doing it, but it was something in her was doing it. And when we prayed and asked the Lord, it became apparent after a while that she was under the influence of an ancestral curse of witchcraft. In other words, back in her family line, down through a number of generations, there, were, there was someone, some person in her ancestry who was an out-and-out -out witch. And that had impacted her. Now today in our evangelical circles, we have no time for such thoughts. We say that, that cannot happen, that's ridiculous. But let me assure you, my friends, I have seen it over and over, and there are others here today who have seen it as well. This is real. This is real. What am I saying from this illustration? What I'm saying is that the sin of the witch to this day is impacting her descendant. What I'm saying is that the wickedness of a person's life will not only impact and really destroy them, but destroy their children and their children after them. Let me give you another illustration. And recently a lady came to see me with a similar problem. Lovely Christian. She went to the Elam church and she was very, very keen for the Lord. But she knew there was something not right. She couldn't ascertain what it was. But she knew coming from a very dysfunctional home where her mother and father had lived very wicked lives. And all her family and suicides and just devastation right across the family line. She knew there were things holding her back. God had rescued her out of that terrible dark place. But she knew there was something holding her back. And so again, the same thing happened. We prayed. And what came up was that one of her ancestors was a murderer. A murderer. And so I said to her, well, what we're going to do is the Lord has revealed that to you. I want you to repent for bloodshed. I want you to say to the Lord, I'm sorry that my ancestor was involved in the shedding of blood. And when we repent for that, I believe the Lord will release you from that which is impacting your life. And when that dear lady began to speak and pray to the Lord, she came to the word bloodshed and she couldn't physically say blood. She couldn't say it. Her mouth went every shape and eventually she stopped. She said, I can't say it. 
I can't say the word. Do you know why she couldn't say the word? Because the enemy, the spirit of murder that was in the ancestral line that was impacting her, did not want her to confess it publicly before the Lord and the throne of God, lest the legal right to that curse would be broken in her life. But she said it eventually. And God wonderfully set her free from that. Now, those are just two illustrations. So I think you can understand why this fascinates me as a Christian. And why when I read the Bible, I, I find it interesting. It's not, it's not culturally acceptable. It's not what the church generally believe. In fact, there are many fine Christians who would say, I'm totally off the rails and I accept that. If they wish to say that, that's fine. That's okay. I have no problem if people wish to say that. But my objective is truth. My objective is to set people free. My objective is that people know the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit in their lives and they can, they can serve the Lord and be a blessing to others. You see, friends, the impact of this uh, event that had happened in Joel's day was in verse 8, he says to them, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of your youth. He said, the impact of your sin has brought this judgment and God has you now in a place. He said, where you're like a young virgin who was ready to be married and her husband has died. He said, that's where God has brought you. That's where God has brought you. Interestingly, and the one that I think we could identify if we were being honest with God today, God's house, in verse 9, it says, The meat offering and drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. You see, you see there's a dryness and an emptiness in the house of the Lord. There's no sense of blessing in the house of the Lord. It's a dry place and there's a mourning among the priests. There's a mourning among the people of God. And dear friends, whenever you begin to follow the Lord and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, in general today, I can't state of every church that would be wrong and unfair, but I think in many cases, if you went with a spirit-filled life into the average evangelical church today, you would go into it and leave it Mourning, mourning for an absence of the presence of the Lord. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, The greatest sign of God's favor is his presence. You can go in and out today of many sanctuaries. And there'll be activity and dancing and shouting and hands waving and musical instruments and you name it, it's there. And you'll go out mourning because there's no sense of the presence of God. And Joel said, God has sent it. His own house is a dry place. And he said then that there would be devastation on the land. It's unproductive. You see, friends, the reason why I asked you to read Nehemiah, and this is very important as we come to the last point. In Nehemiah and chapter 9 and verse 1, there was much sin as Nehemiah was attempting to rebuild the walls. Uh, the, 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 those who had been taken into captivity by the Assyrians uh, were, were, were coming back. And as they were coming back to the land, so Nehemiah was sent in order to rebuild the wall and, and to get this, this little city of Jerusalem up again and, and ultimately to see a temple rebuilt. But when he returned with these people, he became aware that, that the people of God who had returned, they were not living as they should, and they, need, they had intermarried with, with pagans, and there was many things that were displeasing the Lord. And, and so the Lord, he wished to bless them. The Lord had drawn them back to this place and, and he wanted to bless Jerusalem and he, he wanted to encourage Nehemiah and Ezra and others. And so, so the Lord began to speak to them and he said, this is what I want you to do. And he said, I want you to, first of all, to uh, get, a, get aside, get this sin and so on, these uh, broken, these marriages that are not right, get them separated. And so they did that. 
And in verse 1 it says, again in chapter 9, in the 20 and 4th month, uh, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. So they're, they're quite a sight to behold with these Hessian bags on them with big lumps of dirt stuck to their heads. Uh, certainly there's no uh, glamour. Uh, there's nobody coming to church today with big new suit on and latest outfit. Not a good looking day for people going to church, I can tell you. But this is God. God says this is the way it's got to be done now. He said you're going to have to lay aside all your beauty and your garments and all your glamour and your gold and throw it all to the side. And he said you have to come into my presence because I'm grieved with what's going on among you. But I want to bless you. But until things happen and things are done, I can't bless you. And so I'm telling you what to do. I want you to come before me with fasting and put on these old bags and put earth on your, on your head. And he said uh, in verse 2, And the seed of Israel separated themselves from the strangers and stood. And I want you to notice what they did. It's very important. They confessed their sins. Well, we all know that, don't we? Sure, we all know that. And I've done that for 30 years since I got saved. I've been confessing my sins. But here's the one that, that we don't know a lot about. And it's a key. It's a key for the land today. They confessed their sin and the iniquities of their ancestors. I want you to get that again. They confessed their sins and the iniquity of their ancestors. You see, my dear friends, I want you to listen to a quote. It's a different translation. and This is what it says in, in a more, uh, I suppose, a clearer English. They stood and confessed their sins to God, as well as the wicked things their ancestors had done. Now, why were they doing that in Nehemiah's day? And if you continue to read the chapter, you'll discover, we haven't time, but in verse 16, you'll discover after they go through their history, they go right back to the time of Egypt when they've come out and then they begin to disobey God as they get into the land. Now you're talking of a period, Nehemiah's now, he's calling them to confess. It's in around about 450 before Christ, four to five hundred years before Christ, Nehemiah's calling them to repent for their sin and the sins of their ancestors. And they go right back to just after Egypt. They go back almost a thousand years. Almost a thousand years they go back to confess the sins of their ancestors. Who does that? Who does that? Why did God get them to do that? Well, I want to suggest to you what I'm convinced the reason why he did it was just the same reason as that young woman attempted to repent for bloodshed and was finding difficult to do. I'm suggesting it because of the other lady who repented over her ancestry, who were in witchcraft, who went back many generations. But these people, they became aware as Christians, there's something not right. Now, I have Christians undoubtedly who will listen to this and they'll say, did you ever hear such rubbish? Did you ever hear such balarna? Well, I can say that's very possible and probably majority would take that view, but that doesn't really matter to me. You see, friends, what I have discovered is very simple. That when a Christian gets serious with God, and when they really seek God with all their heart, and they repent of their sin, and they abandon their life to Jesus Christ, and they begin to know the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will pull this type of sin to the surface. He'll pull up the problems up. But you see, if you're not a God seeker, and maybe you're only into Greek and Hebrew, and maybe you've been to Bible college and you think you know everything, God's not going to show you any of that. 
This is only about heart. This is not about head or theology. This is about the heart being right with God. God will seal up everything that holds the soul back. He'll bring it up and God will help you to deal with it to set you free. But it's only dependent if you're seeking him. You see, most Christians today, sadly, don't seek God. Most don't seek God. Seek a whole lot of things, but don't seek God. You see, friends, what I want to draw to conclusion is repentance. God wants to bless these people. And God wants to do something significant for them. Because they're in a time when God calls it, and it's a recurring little thought in the book of Joel, but we'll, we'll not bring it up. But you can read it in your leisure. There's a little recurring theme in the book of, of, of Joel, and it's called the year or the, the time of the Lord or the judgment of the Lord. It's talking about that season of God's judgment. God's judgment. And Joel spoke of God's judgment in the past tense. That is, there was a plague had come on these locusts. And he said that was past. But then he said, you're presently under judgment. You're under judgment. Then he said, way into the future, because Joel is being moved by the Holy Spirit. If you care to read it when you go home and look up, I think it's Revelation chapter 6, you'll discover that it talks about this fulfillment that we read about. You remember the bit we said about the Spirit coming on everybody? Well, that all happened in Acts 2. But then it talks about the sun darkening and, and the moon going red and, and all that. Well, when's that truly fulfilled? Well, you have to go to Revelation. That's, that's one of the last plagues poured out on the earth. It hasn't come yet. And so he's talking about this year of the Lord or this this time of judgment that God is bringing. He said it's past, it's present, and it's future. But the Lord wants to avert judgment. That's the reason why the prophetic voice was raised. To avert judgment. The reason why God gives the pictures, gives the dreams, sends the preachers, declares to the people, it's to avert judgment. And so repentance is called for. He says, gird yourselves and lament ye priests, howl ye ministers of the altar. <laughs> Remember many years ago listening to Leonard Ravenhill. And he was talking about all the Bible colleges in England and in America. And he says, boy, you're taught an awful lot in them about Hebrew and Greek and languages and all. But he says, there's none of them teach you how to howl. No Bible colleges can teach you how to howl. No, you can't teach that. That's only the Spirit of God can teach you that. And it wouldn't even, it could be taught. I don't think many Bible colleges would put it, put it on the list, do you? I don't think there'd be many candidates who say, I'll, I'll be in for that. I'll be in for howling before the Lord. Well, repentance. What's the definition? One said the definition of repentance, repentance called for throughout the Bible. You'll be su surprised what this is, actually, I'm sure. Repentance called for throughout the Bible is a summons to a personal, absolute, and ultimate, unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. You thought it was turning from some sin, didn't you? You thought it was, that was what I was going to say. But let me read that again, because it's absolutely true. Repentance called for throughout the Bible is a summons to a personal, absolute, ultimate, unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. This repentance spoken of in the book of Joel was to be led by the priests. The ungodly had no position and there's nothing the ungodly today can do to avert judgment in our land. Don't be looking to Stormont or to uh, the Doyle or to uh, Westminster or the White House. Many of these people are ungodly people. They can't avert judgment. 
Sadly, many of them, many of our political leaders are actually hastening it as they embrace gay marriage, as they embrace the murder of children, as they embrace all these moral uh, uh, perversions, as they open up the gratings of hell, these, these leaders today, and they permit all this to pour out of hell onto the earth. It's dark days we're in. But I'm not here to talk about the darkness. I'm here to tell you, my friends, that always in church history, when a country or a nation or a people came to their lowest and darkest stage, it was only then that God was pleased to demonstrate his power. In the 1950s, I think it was, somebody reminded me recently that Billy Graham got up, I think it was in London somewhere, and he said if God didn't uh, judge uh, America and England for their sin in the 1950s, he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. It was led by the priests. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment begins at the house of God. It is only the house of God where if there is anything to happen that will bring God's blessing back, it begins at the house of God. And God sends his people forth on this occasion with this terrible devastation and the dryness of the house of God and the emptiness of the house of God and all the things that were going on that were so unproductive and unfruitful and unpleasing to the Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to go and to go Gird yourself, you priests, and howl, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, uh, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Now, I suggest to you today we have many activities in our churches, and some of the ones that have most money and greatest ability, my, they can put on a show. Boy, they can put on a show today. And you can go in and there's every device and every mechanism that you could think of and you would be wad if you really were into it. You know, it would really, it would really blow you away. But God said, bring all the people Bring the priests you have to lead by example. Call a special or a, a, a solemn assembly. Come into my house and God says, cry unto the Lord. Now I say to you, where, where would you get that today? Where is anybody even calling for it today? You say, is the country dry? Sure, it's dry. Thank God for people getting saved, but... And even in comparison to whenever I was a convert, there's virtually nobody getting saved in comparison to what happened then. Well, what's the solution? The solution is presented. The Lord says, I want you to come, and I want you as the priest to lead the way, and I want you to introduce, or God says, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to use the priest, and I'm going to bring you into a unique event. <laughs> Solemn assembly is a unique event. This is not standard meeting. This is not the ordinary run of the mill. We're just doing this again. No, 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 this is different. God says, I'm bringing you into something different. You're going to lay aside the normal procedures. This is a solemn assembly. This is a special assembly. And this is all to do with repentance. This is all to do with listening to God through the prophet, through the voice of the prophet, as the prophet makes known what exactly needs to happen and what needs to be done so that the people of God can come together. Now you say, well, Alan, today, how could you get all the churches together for a solemn assembly? Well, the answer is you can't. You can't because if you tried today to get two average believers, even two pastors together, they'll end up fighting before it's over. The simple reason is that this is not a binding of denominations together. This is, there's many people try that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. What this is talking about is God calling a people. 
This is God by his spirit drawing a people together who have the same spirit. These people have the same longing. These people have been stirred by the Holy Spirit and they realize that we're, we're dry in the house of God and we desperately need something to happen. And so they're coming together and they have got their sackcloth on because they're already in mourning in their hearts. They're already in the house of God, but they're different to the man beside them. They're different to the woman beside them because they have the sackcloth off. They're mourning. They feel the pain. They feel the absence of his presence. While others are jingling their hands in the air, they're sitting with an ache in their spirit because they know the Lord is not here. The Lord is not in the midst. And so it's a unique event. And its emphasis is to recognize personal and national sin. That's the emphasis of it. As God draws the group together, personal and national sin. God says, that's what you have to come with. Bring that to me. Now, it's not going to be something that's going to be done in an hour if you're talking about the midweek meeting. God says, come and just, just lie, he says, on the altar all night or beside the altar. God says, it's drawn out thing. It's drawn out. <laughs> But God says, if you do it, and you read the little book later on, God says, I'll turn things. I'll begin to turn things around. As you do the repentance, as you remember what the ancestors have done, as you name that to me, if you, if you, if you deal with those things that I reveal to you through the prophet, God says, then as you walk with me in the light, God says, I'll begin to break off the hold of the enemy. I'll begin to release what the enemy has done. And he said, I'll begin to pour out my spirit on you and on your handmaids and your young people. And he said, I'll begin to bless you. He says, this is what I want you to do, and I'm closing now. He said, I want you to rend your heart and not your garments. <laughs> that was a normal thing. Now, now, very quickly as we close, rending garments simply meant that you looked different. Whenever you went about with your garment all pulled in bits, I mean, you look different. And the Christian who has been moved and the priest that has been stirred by the Lord will look different. They think different. They walk different. They talk different. They're different. They're different people. The type that are going to come into this category, they're different people. Not only did they look different, but they carried this sorrow, this pain, and this cry. And when you read of every true revival that has ever occurred in any nation, you'll find that the individuals who were involved by God as God used them to introduce that revival, they all carried this cry. They all carried this pain. They all carried this sense of national catastrophe. They all recognized the judgment of God upon them. Now you say to me in closing, Alan, it's great that God's prepared to do that, but where would you get people to come together? And listen, God said, bring the nation together, call them all. <laughs> where, how does this all happen? Well, here's good news. Do you remember in the book of Genesis, whenever the Lord spoke? And Abraham got before the Lord and he said, Lord, spare Sodom. Spare it. I know they're wicked, Lord, but spare them. Have mercy on them. He says, if you find 50, will you spare them? The Lord says, yeah, I'll spare them. Then he said, Lord, what about 40? Yeah, I'll spare them for 40. What about 30, Lord? He knew he was going to have a problem. Abraham knew there was a problem getting anybody righteous down in Sodom. So he keeps, keeps pleading with God and he gets down. He said, what about 10, Lord? And the Lord says 10, but that's it. That's where it stops, 10. And I looked this up and I find it very interesting that 10 is a symbol of the authority of God because he had 10 commandments. And it is his government on earth. 10 is the number. God requires 10 in order to save Sodom and Gomorrah. He couldn't do it. 10 before the throne of God have an authority with God. If this is true, and I believe it to be true, it, number 10 is a symbol of the authority of God and his government on earth. God doesn't need the whole nation to come together. God needs a group like what he had in Kells, 
What a group that he had in America, like little groups in different places where they come together and God brings a little group together that makes up enough to bring his government down on earth. He doesn't require vast auditoriums. He needs 10 at least. You see, friends, what I have been thinking is that we're talking sometimes and looking out and saying, Lord, how could we get a solemn assembly? And perhaps God already has solemn assemblies. Perhaps some of them are already set up. Perhaps this is already happening. Perhaps the Lord is already dealing with issues in our ancestry. Perhaps the voice of the prophet is already speaking. One great preacher said, Revival is a divinely initiated work in which God's people begin to pray, repent, and turn or return to a Holy Spirit filled life with a wonderful love relationship with the Lord. The divine warning for repentance. Would you like to be part of that? Maybe you'd rather be doing something else. But it seems to me that much of what our churches are doing today is nothing more than cranking a wheel and doing the evangelical activity three hours in the week. But God says if you take on the sackcloth and you stand in the gap and you begin to repent and be led by the Spirit, I can avert judgment. I can do something wonderful in your land.